Now. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for coming. Where the people who are here. Um, Alexis is a postdoc uh, who just joined last year the group of Alberto Fernandez Nieves doing uh, experiments in active pneumatics. Uh, before that, before that, he was in the University of Pennsylvania, and before that, he did his PhD in the University of Bordeaux. Uh, and he's going to talk today about the work that he did in the University of Pennsylvania, if I understand this correctly. So, uh, yeah, please, Albert, Alexis. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So, yes, I'm uh, Alexis Dacot. I, I'm currently like in the group of um, Professor Fernandez Nieves at, at the University of, of Barcelona, but like today I'm going to talk about what I've done uh, during my previous postdoc um, at the University of Pennsylvania in the group of Arjun Yod, and we're working also in a close collaboration with uh, Tom Rubinsky, who is also at the at UPenn, and Peter Collins, who's at Swarthmore. And uh, my work uh, during my stay at Penn focused on uh, liquid crystals and in particular director fluctuations in liquid crystal, crystal door plates. Um, so first I thought I would give a um, little introduction about liquid crystals because I'm not sure if everyone is like um, good on that. Um, so liquid crystals, the name basically says it all. It's like um, an intermediate phase of matter between liquid and crystals. And we mean that in the sense that um, they behave like both, in the sense that uh, they are liquids, so they flow, uh, but they also have order, uh, positional or orientational. And so in liquid crystal would be uh, flowing, but we also also always have uh, at least positional or orientational order along one direction of space. And this behavior was uh, highlighted and discovered by two um, men, Reynitzer and Lemon, uh, in the late 1800s, uh, were uh, looking at cholesterol and observed that cholesterol doesn't have a single melting point, uh, but has two, one for the transition uh, from crystal to liquid crystal and one from the transition from liquid crystal to isotropic liquid. And so a lot of work has been done on liquid crystals, and um, we understand that this behavior uh, stems from the anisotropy of shape of the constituents. So that can be molecules, or particles, so you have like uh, kind of two classes of liquid crystals, like with the molecular ones, which are more responsive to temperature, and uh, the colloidal ones, which are like more sensitive to um, their volume fraction to form liquid crystal phases. And of course, liquid crystals have come to be like in the center point of uh, a lot of research because they've been widely used today in today's technology. Uh, like in LCDs, the liquid crystal display, which combines their optical properties and their response to external fields. Uh, but nowadays, um, what we aim to do with liquid crystals is to use them as a platform and a platform to do um, direct, directed self-assembly in liquid crystals because you can, they are liquid, so you can immerse particles, nano or micro particles in them, and you can use the elasticity of the liquid crystal to um, pattern shapes and like arrange the particles, um, so like the, par the particles arrange themselves uh, in a in a in a defined way. And so using the elasticity of the liquid crystal, and particularly the defects, the first thing you can do is that when you put particles in liquid crystal, since you have defects that you can see uh, in this um, in the the top left um, image, for example we know that the particles will be drawn towards these defects to kind of minimize the energy cost of these defects. And if you can pattern uh, the way you want defect, then you can pattern uh, the way you arrange particles by having these defects. But also what you can do is that by simply putting um, the particles in the liquid crystal, you would create defects, like you can see in the middle uh, bottom here, you would create defect patterns around the particles themselves and these, um, these defects will interact with each other to try to like combine and minimize again the energy. And you can have like on the on the far right here, like beautiful alignment of like these uh, double emulsion droplets, which like form lines and patterns. So this has been like a really like um, 
um, like motivation for people to like work uh, nowadays on liquid crystals. Um, so uh, to understand these defects and to understand a bit more liquid crystal, I'm going to talk about uh, distortions and anchoring. Um, so if we take a nematic, which is um, a simple, the simplest liquid crystal phase you can have, you simply have uh, only orientational orders. So like the only thing that the the mesogens will do, these little rods here, it's that they will tend to align in the same direction. They will flow and everything, but they will always tend to align locally in the same direction. And this direction uh, is what we call the nematic director. And usually we like represent it with the letter N. But uh, they have, the, these phases have elasticity and they have like distortions in them. And the three main types of distortions that can occur in bulk are like the splay, twist, and bend. So you have like little schematics here. Like so, the splay is more like the V shape. The twist is more like this helical uh, uh, distortion, and the bend is more like this curved uh, distortion. And all of them contribute to uh, the Frank uh, distortion-free energy, which is expressed here. And each material has different contributions to to this energy. Uh, that are named like K1, K2, and K3. So these are material dependent. And the second thing that you can do is that you never have an infinite liquid crystal. You always have boundaries. So what happens at the boundary is important. And so the anchoring of the crystal at the boundary matters a lot. And you have two main kinds of anchoring, which are like either you're parallel to the surface or you're um, perpendicular to the surface. So, um, and these can lead to various configuration. Like in the drop here, you have like, uh, either that that bipolar uh, conformation or this radial conformation with a homeotropic perpendicular anchoring at the surface. And so the combination of anchoring and the minimization of the uh, distortion free energy uh, gives you which conformation your decreaser is going to be. So in our um, experiments, in our system, uh, what we use is drops. So it's a sphere. It's an emulsion drop. So it's a sphere in water. Uh, because the liquid crystal we use 5CB is oil, it's an oil, so like we can immerse it in water and we have surfactant at the interface between the water and the liquid crystal. And this surfactant, um, SDS, which is very classic, uh, promotes uh, perpendicular anchoring at the boundaries. So the simplest uh, and most intuitive um, Conformation you can imagine, which minimizes the free energy, is going to be what we call a radial hedgehog. So you have simply the director will follow the radius of the sphere uh, and will fall along those lines. But it's not so, yeah. So, like basically, you have this um, radial hedgehog, uh, sorry, which is purely splay. So, if you remember, like the schematic section before, that's only there's only contribution of splay. Uh, but, like that. Stability, the, the stability of that hedgehog depends obviously if splay doesn't cost too much for the material. So if, if the ratio of the elastic constant of splay, twist, and bend is in favor of splay. Uh, otherwise, you can have uh, what we call a twisted hedgehog, where you will have always this perpendicular anchoring at the surface, but since splay might cost too much or bend and twist might cost way less than splay, we, we can initiate some twist and bend in the vicinity of the center of the drop. And so, as you can see in both of these schematics, you have a singular point uh, at the center of the drop, which is what we call a defect, and it's a plus one uh, defect, which is imposed by the geometry of, of the sphere and the liquid crystal. And uh, in our case, we also assume that the way we make the drops is simply by mixing uh, the liquid crystal and water and surfactant, and so we just hand mix it, which is convenient to obtain a various range of drop sizes, uh, but also we have the possibility to introduce some water uh, as a core in the center of the drop. Uh, but by itself, this defect core remains to date largely a mystery. So we're not sure exactly what the nature, is it isotropic, is it uh, continuous, is it like, a, there's a lot of like, assumptions and no one has a clear answer about what happens exactly at the center of this core. Um, but in our case, and that's the main point of uh, our experiments in our like um, of my talk today is that we observe none of that. What we observe is this. We have, um, uh, so uh, that's a, a video of a drop in polarized microscopy, which is very like 
used to observe liquid crystals, and you have this cross pattern. But this cross pattern, which is what you expect to observe for um, a regular hedgehog, you can see it's not fixed. It's fluctuating towards a twisting hedgehog. It's not staying either as a twisted hedgehog. It's just coming, coming back and forth between both. So you, we have fluctuations of the director around the core, and none of the uh, twisted or radial hedgehogs seem to be stabilized. And you just oscillate between uh, different conformations. And so our main um, motivation and our main questions where we uh, saw that is, um, is to understand where does this behavior come from and why do we see these? So we go to that giant fluctuation because they're like larger than the like vibrations that we can observe in the crystal. Why do they occur and why do they occur near the core of the drop? Um, so to do that, uh, we first uh, try to set what we want to look at. And so we can distinguish in this um, experiment two types of angular motion that we can focus on. The first one is going to be this cross pattern versus the axis of the image. So how much deviation do you get between the axis of the polarizers and uh, the cross pattern that you actually observe? And so that's kind of like um, uniform rotation of the director around the core. Um, and the second thing that we can uh, have a look at is the intern um, and um, the relative motion of this cross. So that you expect this to be 90 degrees, but it's not always going to be the case. And uh, can we pick up uh, the, 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 also the angular motion that's like set uh, in this, um, um, uh, like the, the vibration of the like, in this direction. Um, so to do that, uh, what we do is to simply look frame by frame at every image of the drop. So we look at a lot of drops, but we look at each frame individually and we pick the center of the drop. So we identify where the center of this drop is, and then we draw a circle that you have here in red at a certain um, fixed radius around, uh, around the core. And then we get an azimuthal intensity profile that you have here. And so you have the blue, which is the, the row signal and the red represents the smooth uh, signal. And from that, we can identify the peaks and valleys of, um, of, the, um, uh, of, the, of the profile. And uh, we can do that for one frame. We can do that for all of the frames. And in time, these peaks and valleys will shift left and right in angles. Um, and we can pick that and we can use that to to do our ana analysis. And the analysis that we want to do uh, is to reconstruct uh, the director feed. So if I just go back uh, here, like we can take advantage of the technique that we use, which is for POM, polarized optical microscopy. And we know that when we reach an intensity peak, um, we simply have uh, the director, which is going to be at a 45 degree angle to the polarizers. And we, when we reach an intensity minimum, we will have the director um, being at um, either aligned with the polarizer or aligned with the analyzer. And so doing that, we can reconstruct the director angle uh, at every point on this circle. And that's what you have here fluctuating. So you can see the direction in which the, the, the director points at in, um, in a, along that circle. And so I've highlighted in, in red when it's like more to the left or like positive uh, fluctuation or like more to the right when it's like blue. And you have like these flashes of like it's all blue or it's all red or sometimes like a bit of both. And what we're particularly interested at here is the angular deviation from the radial configuration. So I know the angle that my director makes um, in this frame. And so I'm looking at what is the difference between the actual director that I have and the actual director that I would expect if I had a radial configuration. And so this is this data beta that we measure here and that we can report here uh, versus time for different position on this uh, circle. And so you can see that they follow more or less each other so that there's like this huge global 
fluctuations, but you have also like some times where like they're not necessarily in sync. And so this measurement of uh, delta beta and this reconstruction of the director field is like the base for our analysis. And we use this um, angular deviation then to build a correlation function. So we build first a correlation function of uh, the angular deviation itself, uh, which is um, um, a correlation in, in space, but also in, in time. Uh, we set uh, then uh, to do a discrete Fourier transform of this correlation function to update this, um, this global correlation function that is plotted here, where you can see like um, three different modes that uh, decay at different times. And so we attribute like the mode m equals zero to be the uniform rotation division and the mode one, three to be like this more relative and like scissor like motion of the of the director. And so this we can do for uh, one drop, but also for like a lot of drops uh, of the of different sizes. Uh, usually we repeat this uh, measurement for like the same drop several times also to get some average. Uh, and we can then like, yeah, like do that for like a lot of drops of different sizes. Um, and we can then report um, like the measurement of first, like the amplitude that we have here of the correlation function uh, for the um, the uniform rotational division. So we, we're going to mainly focus then on, on the uniform one. So like this uh, S zero, and also like we can fit an exponential uh, here to get a, a decay time. Um, and this is what I put here. So you have like a clear radius dependence uh, of the both the reaction time, which increases with drop radius, but also like of the um, um, amplitude of the correlation function um, that also increases with uh, drop radius. And um, we have also like, um, so like there's lines here. So I come back to like explain what these lines are because this is like coming from like all theoretical models. So like once we have that, uh, if we want to understand where, so that's nice measurement, like we have like a quantitative thing, but like our question is like to try to understand where does that come from? So now like we want to focus on building a theory and that's where like we collaborated with uh, Tom Grubensky uh, at Penn to help you like build that. So I'm not going to explain the whole theory because it's very, very complicated. I'm trying to try to explain to you um, like the, the base of it and like where, why things are hard and like where did we like uh, make significant changes from what had been previously published. Um, so the the typical model that we have is, uh, is it simple, like we have a drop and we have a core. Uh, so we assume that at both these interfaces you have homeotropic anchoring. So you have perpendicular, so the director has to be perpendicular at both of these uh, interfaces. So we call R1 the core radius, R2 the drop radius, and then we assume um, we assume a director which is going to be of these forms. So that's in spherical coordinates, and we just assume that you have deviations. Um, so if you had like a pure hedgehog, you would only have ER, like the, the that's what I said, like the, the, the director in the radial conformation is along the radius. You would just have ER, but here we introduce these perturbations along the phi and theta direction. And you have this term in front of ER to because like the director uh, has to have a norm of one. Um, and so the first thing that we do is that we try to decompose these F and G functions and we boot them uh, as a sum of these um, FM and GM functions, which are dependent on R and theta and this exponential of I and phi because you need to have these two pi uh, symmetry. So you need to like, come back to um, the same value when you do one turn of two pi. Um, and once we have that, we can simply plug this director um, into the Frank distortion energy. And this will, this is going to give us, um, I mean, this is going to give us a, lot, a very big equation with a lot of operators that then you can solve for eigenvalues and eigenfunctions to get, to try to get the minimum and minimize 
uh, the free energy. And so one of the main difficulty that arises here compared to previous work is that um, we try to break all symmetries possible. So in previous work, you would have only like functions that would depend on R and theta. So you would assume like uh, uh, axial symmetry around the z-axis. But here we introduce this dependence on phi. And since we have this dependence on phi, this is going to be a lot more complicated. And especially because you will have like cross terms between f and g. So it's going to be hard to separate solutions for f and g individually. Um, and, um, and so that's that was one of the main hurdles that Tom had to work with. Um, and one then to do that, so like the first thing that you want to do is is first assume that so f and g are functions f of m and, and g of m are function of r and theta, but you can make a simple separation of variables is and express them as a product of a function of r and a function of theta. And you can then solve the eigenvalue and eigenfunctions problem, and then you will have solutions which are going to be characterized by eigenvalues, epsilon, and by wave numbers, k. And you can identify the solutions by setting the boundary conditions. So we want this u of r function to be zero at r1 and r2. And that makes so like you have no fluctuations that occur uh, at the boundaries. And that's kind of what we see in the movie, like there's no fluctuations uh, when you look at the surface of the drop. And this gives you a no-load set of vectors and energies and uh, which are like linked to, to each other. So like the, the energy is linked to the, to the wave vectors that you observe. And uh, this is um, the function that we observe and we can make a few intermediate conclusions already. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, as I showed here, the epsilon that we get, um, the epsilon that we get is always positive. So the fact that it's always positive, it means that the radial hedgehog is always stable against twist, regardless of the size of the drop and regardless of uh, the decreaser that we have. So that's the first conclusion we can make. Like the, there's no, in this setup, there's no stable twisted hedgehog. And um, the um, second thing that we observe is that the, the solutions that we have are not dependent on the, independently dependent on the size of the drop in the core, but they're dependent on their ratio. So what matters is not how big your drop is by itself, it's how big it is compared to its core. Um, and uh, this is like the, the, so the, the shape of the solution that we, we get, and we have one dominant mode. So the m equals zero mode, which corresponds to the large fluctuations that you can see is strongly peaked near the core. So you have a large peak near the core, and this is like where our, um, which explains in, in, in part like the, the large fluctuation that we see. And why do we see uh, such large fluctuations is that when we observe, like when we look at the allowed set of um, wave numbers um, for the dominant mode, uh, so this set of wave number depends on mu, which is the, the ratio. So I don't think I said that, but yeah, mu is the, the ratio of the core size and um, versus drop size. And so when you look at these dependents, you have a critical point at mu c where basically like kappa becomes zero or close to zero. And the fact that kappa becomes zero, if you remember like the energy is proportional to kappa. So if kappa, the, the wave number is like basically zero, the energy is going to be also zero. And so that's what allows um, these uh, even though like the, the radial like conformation is like stable, uh, and, like like it allows fluctuations to arise and large fluctuations to arise due to this like large peak uh, of the dominant mode. Um, and these like fluctuations would be like strongly peaked near the core and not anywhere else in, in, in the drop. And so in the case of 5CB, which is the material we used, we observe uh, these um, critical point to be around for a ratio like of 700. But so that's going to depend on the material you use. And um, so once we have this critical behavior, um, that's like the theory. So now we want to connect back to the experiment. So now that like, we have this model, 
which explain um, why we see those uh, giant fluctuations. But we want to see if we can connect our observation with this theory, theory in like in, in some sort of a quantitative way. Um, and so to do that, we make the assumption. I mean, it's not an assumption, but like when we look at the experiment, basically what we look at is more like even if it's like the drop is 3D, but like the approximation that we make for the analysis is that we're looking at a 2D slice. And so we can connect this delta beta, which is like the um, quantity we measured in the experiment to F, F being um, this uh, deviation or, or along the azimuthal direction. And theoretically, we can build then correlation functions uh, that are going to be of this form. So you have epsilon here uh, in S0, and, and you can also like have like a theoretical value for the relaxation time of this correlation function, which is going to be also like um, inversely proportional to epsilon, and gamma is a viscous parameter. Um, and so obviously, like when you approach mu, approach mu C, um, mu approaches mu C, uh, as I said, like kappa approaches zero. Kappa approaching zero means epsilon approaches zero. So it means that both this uh, amplitude here of the correlation function and both the reaction time are going to diverge. Um, and so we can come back to this plot I've showed uh, earlier, where you have the reaction time and the amplitude versus drop radius. And so here what we've done for these lines is that we assume the constant core. Um, and so they, uh, so what you see is that it, it rises sharply around a certain drop size. You have a fixed core. So like uh, at a certain like drop radius, you will get uh, this uh, critical behavior. And so that's why like you see this shooting up in um, both the reaction time and the, and, the, and, the, and the amplitude. And the viscous parameter also like is fixed here. Uh, and basically that's like something we can measure uh, or that has been measured in literature because it's simply the inverse of the rotational viscosity. So here we have like this fixed R and this like critical behavior that happens um, at a specific, uh, very like precise like drop radius R, and you can see that it doesn't describe uh, very well our, our data. It's not like horrible, but it's not like great. And the reason that we uh, can say it's, it, it, it doesn't fit well with our expert data is because we have nothing in our experiment that says that the drop core has to be constant in size. Like, as I said, like we, we mix it, like we don't do microfluidics or like something very precise in experiment. So we have the potential to get um, a core size of, of a different, like a core of different size for every drop. But what we can do is that we can make some kind of like, uh, we can like try to get back what the core size is for each of our drop. And to do that, we just can simply look at the amplitude of our correlation function and the recession time that we can measure. And they both depend on epsilon. So for, from both of them, you can get back a value of epsilon. If you have a value of epsilon, you can go back to get a value of kappa, which can then, then give you a value of mu. And then if you know R2, which we can measure optically, you can get back uh, the value of the core. Uh, and so that's what is plotted here. So like um, the open circles are doing that with uh, the, the amplitude, the, the black circles are like doing that with uh, the um, relaxation time. And what we can see is that uh, all of our drops fall uh, along the critical line um, uh, or along this critical line. And so what we have is that um, there's like a little uh, deviation from uh, what the critical core radius would be for this drop size. But like all of our fluctuating drops are near this critical point. And this is why we see those like fluctuations. And, um, and it makes sense that we, uh, and uh, it makes sense that like I, like we picked these drops to observe uh, because they were close. And I mean, they, they only fluctuate because they are close to these uh, critical point and they are close to the critical point and that's the only, and because they are fluctuating, that's the only reason why we observed them. We didn't look at 
uh, drops that do not fluctuate, but you can see that there's like um, that, that there's like a, a mix of both in, in a sample. So if you have here, like you have two drops that play the movie, you have one drop where you can see uh, a, a core which is like clearly visible here in optical microscopy. Uh, and so this side of the core is large enough so that the mu, so the ratio of the core size to drop size is going to be below this critical point. But here you don't see a core because it's like too small to be seen in optical microscopy. And so you are here um, at, um, at the critical uh, point. And so that's here like in, in bright field microscopy. But when we put on the polarizers, uh, you can see that one of the drop, the one at the critical point is fluctuating, but the one where you're not near the critical point is simply not moving. And you can explain that simply by what we've just seen uh, in, in, in optical microscopy, um, that, that the, the core is like too large and doesn't allow for the fluctuations um, to arise. Um, one last thing that we do is that, uh, so to do all of this analysis, what we get at the end is like we obtain solutions for f and g and so if we have solutions for f and g um, we can use uh, Jones calculus to simply get a projection of what the the, the, the pom pattern uh, the price optical microscopy pattern would be theoretically and so we can have here like um, a comparison between like uh, what we observe experimentally and what the theory uh, what we expect with the, the, the solution, solutions that we get from, from, from the theory. Um, and so that gives you like a, a nice visual comparison, which is also like always nice to, to have. So like to, to see like we, we have a, like a good solution. Um, and I think, yeah, that's uh, pretty much going to be the conclusion. Uh, so what I've talked about is our newly observation of like twist fluctuations in the metal droplets, which are like very close to the defect core. And uh, in addition to doing like an experimental analysis about this um, uh, this um, this behavior, we also provide a, a model, a theoretical model, which uh, matches our experimental observations, but also like highlights uh, a new type of critical point without really a phase transition, which is like a critical point that allows for this um, for these uh, fluctuations to arise. And through that, we can get a prediction for this fluctuating door place of the core size, which is like between five and 20 nanometers, which is not far also like from like uh, core sizes that you could expect in, in theory. And um, so this, this like beyond like just the fact that it's for us, it's a nice theoretical and like experimental and analysis. It's also like uh, interesting to have this kind of model to be able to probe um, like um, defects in a new way, and especially when we'll, um, uh, especially when like the idea is to use these defects as a platform to build like self self assembly, and then you can also like uh, imagine uh, a new kind of like um, system where you have like um, nanoparticles trapped in this defect, which are like you can tr like trigger in some way to change size. And this change of size size can like give you like fluctuations, like and you can have a, a system that can could turn on and off this kind uh, of fluctuations. And so I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's what I have. So um, yeah, thank you for your attention. And let me know if you have questions. Thank you very much, Alexis. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, okay, so I do have a question. Okay. So I didn't. I missed a little bit uh, at some point. So the the defect core is not. It's just where the where the lines are twisting. No. So there's no thing. There's no so, different material or anything. I mean, there there, there has to be something here. Uh, the thing is, like the, like like when you look at this, like there's no. It's a defect. So there's no definition for that. What happens exactly at this point? Uh -huh. uh, uh, in in like in, in in the material, so like there's a lot of speculation about what's there, and it could be that it's a continuous decrease of the par or the parameter, or you could have like some kind of isotropic, like it's very small, like it it, it does it's like very very small, but like you can have like some 
methyl isotropic, some like assume maybe you have a ring, uh, defect ring instead of like a pure like point defect. But, but my question was, so it's only liquid crystal. There's nothing changing in chemical composition. It's just the order. Oh yeah, yeah. there's no, there's no, there's no change. Uh, uh, it's, it's the same everywhere. Because you said something about uh, modifying the 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 size of the uh, core by microfluidics, but it doesn't seem that this could be done, could it? Or I don't know, maybe. I, I think I think I mean the idea that you could imagine is that you could put a nanoparticle in there that you could change size, um, mm -hmm. that you could somewhat like I don't know how like yeah, that's wishful thinking, but you could energy change energy. the size of and like you could like have a core which has like um kind of like could like change size with some extra trigger but like that's that's we're really far from that like that's just like okay. that's some that, that would be a good idea maybe yeah, yeah. Um, but i don't know how doable that is yeah and the and the in different particles the core is is kind of random so uh in in our drops it, it is random uh, because right. Uh, we don't control, I mean, we control like how we make the drops, but like like not as well as you would in microfluidics, for example. It's like a simple like emulsification, emulsification process. And so like that's why like you have like the possibility to introduce some um, like water inside. And that's what you have here in this drop. You probably have wow. like a small drop of water that you can see yeah, yeah, yeah. that you don't have in, in this one. And this 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 bubble of water prevents like the fluctuations yeah. to arise. Uh, so there's questions, but I so Josue raised his hand. I don't know if he's in the chat. Yeah. So uh, I just read them. So one, does mu has to be near the uh, critical? mu to observe the defect. Uh, uh, however, at the beginning, what you try to obtain, uh, what do you try to obtain with it? Or why? And SDS concentration, the diameter size. So yes, mu has to be near the critical point to observe the fluctuations because if you look at this, like it drops very sharply here. So you have to be close to mu C to observe like the the fluctuations uh then like um i don't know like what the second part of the question was but like we use sds it like we use like a concentration which is like uh below like cmc um to make the 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 emission uh we use different surfactants uh we try to use different surfactants and it always works with other surfactants just like sds is the easiest one to use and the most like common to use with VACCB um, to make like this homotropic anchoring. And I guess the other part is what the temperature uh, of the VACCB? Uh, the temperature, like, so here we do room temperature, so like 20, 20, 23 degrees Celsius, and the melting temperature of VACCB is about 35 um, degrees Celsius. Like the transition from pneumatic to isotropic for 5 CB. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so is there any other questions? Gaspar. Yeah. Do, do you hear me? I do. I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my question is when you look at the video, you have the feeling that the core um, is rotating like a solid like rotation. Could you confirm it or? Or is there, for example, a, no, a flow field, more comp more, more complex flow field? Um, so the 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 core is. So you mean like like it's the director is moving around like the, the the director is like twisting around the core. The core is moving like there's translational motion of the core for sure. Uh, it's very small, but there is some motion of the core, and then like it's. There's obviously like, I guess, some hydrodynamics that are involved, but we did not include that in our model uh, for sure. Um, but that's something that someone could look at also if, 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 they, if they want to, but we didn't look at any like hydrodynamics in our model. Okay. And why is it just uh, like an optical trick or because 
we have the feeling that the like the boundary because between the core and the rest of the drop is super sharp and yeah that's it, it's made because... of the same material so why, why is it so sharp um, yeah so you have like uh, it's a sphere uh, so you have interferences intervals patterns and so that's why you have this clear distinction yeah you have like this kind of that's why also you have different colors because of different thickness uh, because like the light doesn't have to go through the mm. same thickness of the material. Okay. 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 Thank you. Any other questions? If not, um, thank you very much, Alexis. It's very nice. Uh, and I'll see you everyone the next one, two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.